Section 27 of Diaries, Volume 1 by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. The weather being hot, and having sent my man on before, I rode negligently under favour of the shade, till, within three miles of Bromley, at a place called the Procession Oak, two cutthroats started out, and striking with long staves at the horse, and taking hold of the reins, threw me down, took my sword, and hauled me into a deep thicket, some quarter of a mile from the highway, where they might securely rob me, as they soon did. What they got of money was not considerable, but they took two rings, the one an emerald with diamonds and the other an onyx and a pair of buckles set with rubies and diamonds which were of value and after all bound my hands behind me and my feet having before pulled off my boots they then set me up against an oak with most bloody threats to cut my throat if I offered to cry out or make any noise for they should be within hearing I not being the person they looked for I told them that if they had not basely surprised me, they should not have had so easy a prize, and that it would teach me never to ride near the hedge, since had I been in the midway, they dared not have adventured on me, at which they cocked their pistols and told me they had long guns too, and were fourteen companions. I begged for my onyx and told them it being engraved on their arms would betray them, but nothing prevailed. My horse's bridle they slipped and searched the saddle which they pulled off, but let the horse graze, and then turning again bridled him and tied him to a tree, yet so as he might graze, and thus left me bound. My horse was perhaps not taken because he was marked and cropped on both ears and well known on that road. Left in this manner, grievously was I tormented with flies, ants and the sun, nor was my anxiety little how I should get loose in that solitary place where I could neither hear nor see any creature but my poor horse and a few sheep straggling in the copse. After near two hours attempting, I got my hands to turn palm to palm, having been tied back to back, and then it was long before I could slip the cord over my wrist to my thumb, which at last I did, and then soon unbound my feet, and saddling my horse and roaming a while about, I at last perceived dust to rise, and soon after heard the rattling of a cart toward which I made, and by the help of two countrymen I got back into the highway. I rode to Colonel Blount's, a great justiciary of the times, who sent out hue and cry immediately. The next morning, sore as my wrists and arms were, I went to London and got five hundred tickets printed and dispersed by an officer of Goldsmith's Hall, and within two days had tidings of all I had lost, except my sword, which had a silver hilt, and some trifles. The rogues had pawned one of my rings for a trifle to a goldsmith's servant before the tickets came to the shop, by which means they escaped. The other ring was bought by a victualler, who brought it to a goldsmith, but he, having seen the ticket, seized the man. I afterward discharged him on his protestation of innocence. Thus did God deliver me from these villains, and not only so, but restored what they took, as twice before he had graciously done, both at sea and land, I mean when I had been robbed by pirates and was in danger of a considerable loss at Amsterdam for which, and many, many signal preservations, I am extremely obliged to give thanks to God my Saviour. 25th June 1652 After a drought of near four months, there fell so violent a tempest of hail, rain, wind, thunder and lightning as no man had seen the like in his age, the hail being in some places four or five inches about broke all glass about London, especially at Deptford, and more at Greenwich. 29th June 1652 I returned to Tunbridge and again drank the water, till 10th of July. 
we went to see the house of my lord Clan Rickard at Summer Hill near Tunbridge, now given to that villain Bradshaw who condemned the king. It is situated on an eminent hill with a park, but has nothing else extraordinary. 4th July 1652. I heard a sermon at Mr. Packer's chapel at Groomsbridge, a pretty melancholy seat, well wooded and watered. In this house is one of the French kings kept prisoner. The chapel was built by Mr. Packer's father in remembrance of King Charles I's safe return out of Spain. Penshurst 9th July 1652 we went to see Penshurst, the Earl of Leicester's famous once for its gardens and excellent fruit, and for the noble conversation which was wont to meet there, celebrated by that illustrious person, Sir Philip Sidney, who there composed diverse of his pieces. It stands in a park, is finely watered, and was now full of company on the marriage of my old fellow collegiate Mr. Robert Smith, who married my lady Dorothy Sidney, widow of the Earl of Sunderland. One of the men who robbed me was taken. I was accordingly summoned to appear against him, and on the twelfth was in Westminster Hall, but not being bound over nor willing to hang the fellow, I did not appear, coming only to save a friend's bail. But the bill being found, he was turned over to the old bailey. In the meantime I received a petition from the prisoner whose father I understood was an honest old farmer in Kent. He was charged with other crimes and condemned, but reprieved. I heard afterward, had it not been for his companion, a younger man, he would probably have killed me. He was afterward charged with some other crime, but refusing to plead, was pressed to death. 23rd July 1652 came my old friend Mr. Spencer to visit me. 30th July 1652 I took advice about purchasing Sir Richard Brown's interest of those who had bought Say's Court. 1st August 1652 came old Jerome Lenier of Greenwich, a man skilled in painting and music, and another rare musician called Mel. I went to see his collection of pictures, especially those of Giulio Romano, which surely had been the king's, and an Egyptian figure, etc. There are also excellent things of Polydor, Guido, Raphael and Tintoretto. Lenier had been a domestic of Queen Elizabeth, and showed me her head, an intaglio in a rare sardonyx, cut by a famous Italian, which he assured me was exceedingly like her. 24th August 1652. My first child, a son, was born precisely at one o'clock. 2nd September 1652. Mr. Owen, the sequestered divine of Eltham, christened my son by the name of Richard. 22nd September 1652. I went to Woodcott, where Lady Brown was taken with scarlet fever and died. She was carried to Deptford and interred in the church near Sir Richard's relations with all decent ceremonies and according to the church office for which I obtained permission after it had not been used in that church for seven years. Thus ended an excellent and virtuous lady, universally lamented, having been so obliging on all occasions to those who continually frequented her house in Paris, which was not only a hospital, but an asylum to all our persecuted and afflicted countrymen, during eleven years' residence there, in that honourable situation. 25th September 1652. I went to see Dr. Mason's house, so famous for the prospect, for the house is a wretched one, and description of Barclay's Icon Animarum. 5th November 1652, to London to visit some friends, but the insolences were so great in the streets that I could not return till the next day. Dr Scarborough was instant with me to give the tables of veins and arteries to the College of Physicians, 
pretending he would not only read upon them, but celebrate my curiosity as being the first who caused them to be completed in that manner, and with that cost. But I was not so willing yet to part with them, as to lend them to the college during their anatomical lectures, which I did accordingly. 22nd November 1652 I went to London where was proposed to me the promoting that great work, since accomplished by Dr. Walton, Bishop of Chester, Biblio Polyglotta, by Mr. Pearson, that most learned divine. 25th December 1652 Christmas Day, no sermon anywhere, no church being permitted to be open, so observed it at home. The next day we went to Lewisham, where an honest divine preached. 31st December 1652 I adjusted all accounts and rendered thanks to Almighty God for his mercies to me the year past. Says Court 1st January 1652-53 I set apart in preparation for the Blessed Sacrament which the next day Mr. Owen administered to me and all my family in Say's Court, preaching on John 6, 32-33, showing the exceeding benefits of our blessed Saviour taking our nature upon him. He had christened my son and church my wife in our own house, as before noticed. 17th January 1653 I began to set out the oval garden at Say's Court, which was before a rude orchard, and all the rest one entire field of one hundred acres, without any hedge, except the hither holly hedge joining to the back of the Mount Walk. This was the beginning of all the succeeding gardens, walks, groves, enclosures and plantations there. 21st January 1653 I went to London and sealed some of the writings of my purchase of Say's Court. 30th January 1653, at our own parish church, a stranger preached. There was now and then an honest orthodox man got into the pulpit, and though the present incumbent was somewhat of the independent, yet he ordinarily preached sound doctrine and was a peaceable man, which was an extraordinary felicity in this age. 1st February 1653 Old Alexander Ross, author of Virgilius Evangelizans and many other little books, presented me with his book against Mr. Hobbes' Leviathan. 19th February 1653 I planted the orchard at Say's Court, New Moon, Wind West. 22nd February 1653 was perfected the sealing livery and season of my purchase of Say's Court. My brother George Glanville, Mr. Scudamore, Mr. Offley, Co. William Glanville, son Sergeant Glanville, sometimes Speaker of the House of Commons, Co. Stevens, and several of my friends dining with me. I had bargained for £3,200, but I paid £3,500. 25th March 1653 came to see me that rare graver in Tai Douce, Monsieur Richard. He was sent by Cardinal Mazarin to make a collection of pictures. 11th April 1653 I went to take the air in Hyde Park, where every coach was made to pay a shilling and horse sixpence by the sordid fellow who had purchased it of the state, as they called it. 17th May 1653 My servant Hall, who wrote those exquisite several hands, fell of a fit of an apoplexy, caused, as I suppose, by tampering with mercury about an experiment in gold. London 29th May 1653 I went to London to take my last leave of my honest friend Mr Barton, now dying, it was a great loss to me and to my affairs. On the 6th of June I attended his funeral. 8th June 1653 Came my brother George, Captain Evelyn, the great traveller, Monsieur Mouschamp, my cousin, Thomas K. 
Keithley and a virtuoso fantastical Simons who had the talent of embossing so to the life. 9th June 1653 I went to visit my worthy neighbour Sir Henry Newton and consider the prospect, which is doubtless for city, river, ships, meadows, hill, woods and all other amenities, one of the most noble in the world. So as had the house running water, it were a princely sea. Mr. Henshaw and his brother-in-law came to visit me, and he presented me with a selenoscope. 19th June 1653. This day I paid all my debts to a farthing. Oh, blessed day! 21st June 1653. My lady Gerard and one Esquire Knight, a very rich gentleman living in Northamptonshire, visited me. 23rd June 1653. Mr Lombart, a famous graver, came to see my collections. 27th June 1653. Monsieur Rupel sent me a small phial of his Aurum Potabile with a letter showing the way of administering it and the stupendous cures it had done at Paris, but ere it came to me, by what accident I know not, it was all run out. 17th August 1653 I went to visit Mr Hildyard at his house at Horsley, formerly the great Sir Walter Raleigh's, where met me Mr Altred, the famous mathematician. He showed me a box or golden case of diverse rich and aromatic balsams which a chemist, a scholar of his, had sent him out of Germany. 21st August 1653 I heard that good old man, Mr Hyam, the parson of the parish of Watton where I was born and who had baptised me, preach after his very plain way on Luke, comparing this troublesome world to the sea, the ministers to the fishermen and the saints to the fish. 22nd August 1653 We all went to Guildford to rejoice at the famous inn, the Red Lion, and to see the hospital and the monument of Archbishop Abbott, the founder, who lies buried in the chapel of his endowment. 28th September 1653 At Greenwich preached the holy martyr Dr. Hewer on Psalm 90, 11, magnifying the grace of God to penitence and threatening the extinction of his gospel light for the prodigious impiety of the age. 11th October 1653 My son John Stansfield was born, being my second child, and christened by the name of my mother's father, that name now quite extinct, being of Cheshire. Christened by Mr Owen in my library at Say's Court, where he afterward churched my wife, I always making use of him on these occasions, because the parish minister dared not have officiated according to the form and usage of the Church of England, to which I always adhered. 25th October 1653. Mr Owen preached in my library at Say's Court on Luke uh, 18.7. 8. An excellent discourse on the unjust judge, showing why Almighty God would sometimes be compared by such similitudes. He afterward administered to us all the Holy Sacrament. London. 28th October 1653. Went to London to visit my Lady Gerard, where I saw that cursed woman called the Lady Norton, of whom it was reported that she spit in our king's face as he went to the scaffold. Indeed, her talk and discourse was like an impudent woman. 21st November 1653 I went to London to speak with Sir John Evelyn, my kinsman, about the purchase of an estate of Mr Lambard's at Westroom, which afterwards Sir John himself bought for his son-in-law Leach. 4th December 1653 Going this day to our church, I was surprised to see a tradesman, a mechanic, step up. I was resolved yet to stay and see what he would make of it. His text was from 2 Samuel's 23.20 And Benaiah went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in the time of snow. 
The purport was that no danger was to be thought difficult when God called for shedding of blood, inferring that now the saints were called to destroy temporal governments. With such feculent stuff, so dangerous a crisis were things grown to. 25th December 1653, Christmas Day, no churches or public assembly. I was fain to pass the devotions of that blessed day with my family at home. 20th January 1653-54, come to see my old acquaintance and the most incomparable player on the Irish harp, Mr Clarke, after his travels. He was an excellent musician, a discreet gentleman, born in Devonshire, as I remember. Such music before or since did I never hear, that instrument being neglected for its extraordinary difficulty, but, in my judgment, far superior to the lute itself, or whatever speaks with strings. 25th January 1654 Died my son, J. Stansfield, of convulsion fits. Buried at Deptford on the east corner of the church, near his mother's great-grandfather and other relatives. 8th February 1654, Ash Wednesday. In contradiction to all custom and decency, the usurper Cromwell feasted at the Lord Mayor's, riding in triumph through the city. 14th February 1654. I saw a tame lion play familiarly with a lamb. He was a huge beast, and I thrust my hand into his mouth and found his tongue rough like a cat's. A sheep also with six legs, which made use of five of them to walk. A goose that had four legs, two crops, and as many vents. 29th March 1654. That excellent man, Mr. Owen, preached in my library on Matthew 28 6, a resurrection sermon, and after it we all received the Holy Communion. 6th April 1654. Came my Lord Herbert, Sir Kenelm Digby, Mr. Denham, and other friends to see me. 15th April 1654. I went to London to hear the famous Jeremy Taylor, since Bishop of Down and Connor, at St Gregory's near St Paul's, on Matthew 6.48, concerning the evangelical perfection. 5th May 1654. I bound my lackey, Thomas Headley, apprentice to a carpenter, giving with him five pounds and new clothing. He thrived very well and became rich. 8th May 1654. I went to Hackney to see Lady Brooks Garden, which was one of the neatest and most celebrated in England, the house well furnished but a despicable building. Returning, visited one Mr. Tombs Garden. It has large and noble walks, some modern statues, a vineyard planted in strawberry borders, staked at ten feet distances, the banqueting house of cedar, where the couch and seats were carved à l'antique. Some good pictures in the house, especially one of Van Dyck's, being a man in his shirt, also some of Stenwick. I also called at Mr. Juice's, who has indeed a rare collection of the best masters, and one of the largest stories of Hans Holbein. I also saw Sir Thomas Fowler's aviary, which is a poor business. 10th May 1654 my Lady Gerard treated us at Mulberry Garden, now the only place of refreshment about the town for persons of the best quality to be exceedingly cheated at. Cromwell and his partisans, having shut up and seized on Spring Garden, which till now had been the usual rendezvous for the ladies and gallants at this season. 11th May 1654 I now observed how the women began to paint themselves, formerly a most ignominious thing, and used only by prostitutes. 14th May 1654 There being no such thing as church anniversaries in the parochial assemblies, I was forced to provide at home Whit Sunday. 15th May 1654 Came Sir Robert Stapleton, the translator of Juvenal, to visit me. 8th June 1654 
my wife and I set out in a coach and four horses in our way to visit relations of hers in Wiltshire and other parts, where we resolved to spend some months. We dined at Windsor, saw the castle and chapel of St George, where they have laid our blessed martyr, King Charles, in the vault just before the altar. The church and workmanship in stone is admirable. The castle itself is large in circumference, but the room is melancholy and of ancient magnificence. The keep or mount hath beside its incomparable prospect a very profound well, and the terrace toward Eton, with the park, meandering Thames and sweet meadows, yield one of the most delightful prospects. That night we lay at Reading, saw my Lord Craven's house at Corsam, now in ruins, his goodly woods felling by the rebels. 9th June 1654 Dined at Marlborough, which having been lately fired, was now new built. At one end of this town we saw my Lord Seymour's house, but nothing observable save the mount, to which we ascended by windings for near half a mile. It seems to have been cast up by hand. We passed by Colonel Popham's, a noble seat, park and river. Thence to Newbury, a considerable town, and Donington, famous for its battle, siege and castle. This last had been in the possession of old Geoffrey Chaucer. Then to Aldermaston, a house of Sir Humphrey Forster's, built à la Mordaine. Also that exceedingly beautiful seat of my Lord Pembroke, on the ascent of hill, flanked with wood, and regarding the river, and so at night to Caddenham, a mansion of Edward Hungerford Esquire, uncle to my wife, where we made some stay. The rest of the week we did nothing but feast and make good cheer, to welcome my wife. 27th June 1654. We all went to see Bath, where I bathed in the cross bath. Among the rest of the idle diversions of the town, one musician was famous for acting a changeling, which indeed he personated strangely. The art of this cathedral is remarkable for its historical carving. The king's bath is esteemed the fairest in Europe. The town is entirely built of stone, but the streets narrow, uneven and unpleasant. Here we trifled and bathed, and intervisited with the company who frequent the place for health till the 30th, and then went to Bristol, a city emulating London, not for its large extent, but manner of buildings, shops, bridges, traffic, exchange, market place, etc. The governor showed us the castle of no great concernment. The city wholly mercantile as standing near the famous Severn, commodiously for Ireland and the Western world. Here I first saw the manner of refining sugar and casting it into loaves, where we had a collection of eggs fried in the sugar furnace, together with excellent Spanish wine. But what appeared most stupendous to me was the rock of St Vincent, a little distance from the town, the precipice whereof is equal to anything of that nature I have seen in the most confrigiose cataracts of the Alps, the river gliding between them at an extraordinary depth. Here we went searching for diamonds and to the hot wells at its foot. There is also on this side of this horrid Alp a very romantic seat, and so we returned to Bath in the evening, and July 1st to Cadillum. 4th July 1654. On a letter from my wife's uncle, Mr. Pretterman, I waited back on her to London, passing by Hungerford, a town famous for its trouts, and the next day arrived at Deptford, which was sixty miles in the extremity of heat. Oxford. 6th July 1654. I went early to London, and the following day met my wife and company at Oxford, the eve of the act. 8th July 1654. Was spent in hearing several exercises in the schools, and after dinner the proctor opened the act at St Mary's, according to custom, and the prevaricators their drollery. Then the doctors disputed. We supped at Wadham College. 9th July 1654. Dr. French preached at St. Mary's on Matthew 12.42, 
advising the students the search after true wisdom, not to be had in the books of philosophers, but in the scriptures alone. In the afternoon, the famous independent Dr. Owen per stringing episcopacy. He was now Cromwell's vice-chancellor. We dined with Dr. Ward, mathematical professor, since Bishop of Sarum, and at night supped in Balliol College Hall, where I had once been student and fellow commoner, and where they made me extraordinarily welcome. 10th July, 1654. On Monday I went again to the schools to hear the several faculties, and in the afternoon tarried out the whole act in St Mary's, the long speeches of the proctors, the vice-chancellor, the several professors, creation of doctors by the cap, ring, kiss, etc., those ancient ceremonies and institution being as yet not wholly abolished. Dr Kendall, now in sceptre among others, performing his act incomparably well, concluded it with an excellent oration, abating his Presbyterian animosities, which he withheld, not even against that learned and pious divine, Dr Hammond. The act was closed with the speech of the Vice-Chancellor, there being but four in theology and three in medicine, which was thought a considerable matter, the Times considered. I dined at one Monsieur Fiat's, a student at Exeter College, and supped at a magnificent entertainment of Wadham Hall, invited by my dear and excellent friend Dr Wilkins, then warden, after Bishop of Chester. 11th July 1654 was the Latin sermon which I could not be at, though invited being taken up at All Souls, where we had music, voices and theorbos performed by some ingenious scholars. After dinner I visited that miracle of a youth, Mr Christopher Wren, nephew to the Bishop of Ely, then Mr Barlow, since Bishop of Lincoln, bibliotecarius of the Bodleian Library, my most learned friend. He showed us the rarities of that most famous place, manuscripts, medals and other curiosities, among the manuscripts, an old English Bible, wherein the eunuch mentioned to be baptised by Philip is called the Gelding, and Philip and the Gelding went down into the water, etc. The original acts of the Council of Basil nine hundred years since, with a buller or lead and a fix, which has a silken cord passing through every parchment, a manuscript of Venerable Bede of eight hundred years antiquity, the old ritual secundum usum sarum, exceeding voluminous. Then, among the nicer curiosities, the Proverbs of Solomon, written in French by a lady, every chapter of a several character, or ham, the most exquisite imaginable, and hieroglyphical table or carter, folded up like a map, I suppose it painted on asses high, extremely rare. But what is most illustrious, there were no less than 1,000 manuscripts in 19 languages, especially Oriental, furnishing that new part of the library built by Archbishop Lord from a design of Sir Kenelm Digby and the Earl of Pembroke. In the closet of the tower they show some Indian weapons, urns, lamps, etc., but the rarest is a whole Al-Quran, written on one large seat of calico, made up in a priest's vesture or cope, after the Turkish and Arabic character, so exquisitely written as no printed letter comes near it, also a roll of magical charms, diverse talismans and some medals. Then I led my wife into the convocation house, finely wainscoted, the divinity school and gothic carved roof, the physic or anatomy school, adorned with some rarities of natural things, but nothing extraordinary save the skin of a jackal, a rarely coloured jacket too or prodigious large parrot, two hummingbirds, not much bigger than our bumblebee, which indeed I had not seen before that I remember. End of section 27